This is a presentation of BSRN, Box Studios Radio Network. The Power Play Post Show is on the air, covering minor league hockey since 2003, and now covering the Binghamton Black Bears, with news, reactions, and in-depth interviews only heard here. And now, from the Box Studios in Kirkwood, New York, here is your host of the Power Play Post Show, Bob Howard. And hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Power Play Post Show. This is the show for... January 4th, 2024. This is episode 13 of season number 13. So lucky number 13 for this episode. And lucky for us, we have a great guest. This is also episode 398 of the long-running podcast that is the Power Play Post Show. We're only two episodes away from our 400th episode of the Power Play Post Show. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, and I'm just so very grateful that in 2024, you guys are still listening to this show. Thank you very much. As always, I appreciate it. My name is Bob Howard. I am your host. And uh, what a what a great what a great time of the year. I love the holidays. I love Christmas and Thanksgiving. And I love the new year. I love everything ar- around that. Uh, it, it feels great to be around uh, your family and your friends. And for me, at this time of year, when I'm getting to talk to hockey players and coaches and so on and so forth, I think that's a very cool thing as well. So um, I want to just say that tomorrow on the Power Play Post Show Facebook page or group, I want you guys to go in and look for a post. It'll come out around 12 noonish. It's going to be a poll. I'm going to have three players. I'm going to let you guys pick next week's guest. Okay. Hopefully this works out, right? Because hopefully something doesn't get in the way of this. But next week, I'm going to let you guys pick the the the, the guest that I have for next week. So there's going to be a poll on the Facebook group for the Power Play Post Show. I might share that to a couple of the other groups just to get the most visibility. And you guys can vote and tell me who you want me to interview next. I'll have a few options up there. And I think it'll be pretty cool to have you, the fans, kind of like say, hey, listen, we want to hear from this guy. Um, Nikita's probably off the books just because of his English. So he will not be in the poll. Um, And I don't think Donald Oliveri will be because – his schedule is just not conducive uh, really for uh, the, an interview of this type. So those two guys will be um, off there. Even I really want to talk to Donald Oliveri. At some point, he is like the part of the leadership group here with the Binghamton Black Bears, um, without a doubt. Uh, but let's get into this. Uh, the Power Play Post Show is on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and iHeartRadio. Just search Power Play Post Show on whichever platform you listen to your podcast and subscribe. Please join the Power Play Post Show Facebook group. Just go to Facebook, search for Power Play Post Show, and share it with all your friends and family, especially if they like Binghamton Hockey. Uh, check out BinghamtonHockey.net for all your Binghamton Hockey information curiosity. And this week on the Power Play Post Show, head coach of the Binghamton Black Bears, Brant Sherwood, making his return. I think this is the third official sit-down interview um, that I've done with Brant. Uh, I very much enjoy all my conversations on air, off air with Coach Sherwood. I talk to him every single week. I ask him questions. He gives me information about the team. Some I can share. Some of that information I can share. Some of the information I cannot share. Um, And that's just the way that relationship between sometimes media and uh, the team has to go. Sometimes they can give us information that can be on the record, and some of the information cannot be on the record. Uh, But I enjoy my conversation with Brant all the time. He just... He's just a likable guy, you know, and uh, I hope uh, other people find um, the same thing with him. So one of the things I want to do before I get into the meat and potatoes of this episode and everything is I want to bring up the BinghamtonHockey.net page because there are a, 
uh, there's some things that I've added to the page, which I've shared in the Binghamton Black Bears Facebook group, uh, the, the, yeah, the fan group and everything. And um, one of those is the, the, the page that I just created about the top five for Binghamton Black Bears over the past three years, right? So this is the top five list of all the offensive stats. I have not gotten into the, I was thinking about doing defensive stats and goaltending. It might be just goaltending, um, but we'll, 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 we'll see. But I really wanted to bring this up because I hope everybody is checking this stuff out and going to the BinghamtonHockey.net page and and seeing the this, this stuff that we've created. So obviously the first thing is games played, right? We all know that Nikita Ivashkin now holds the lead with games played with 114 games played. Josh Newberg has 103 games played. Gino D'Angelo, 102. Matthew Boulard just tied Gino D'Angelo with 102 games played. And Tyler Jurich has 91. There were a couple other players that are starting to creep up uh, to those guys. And that would be uh, Tyson Kirkby, uh, who has 87 games played. And Gavin Yates, who has 90 games played. So this upcoming weekend, uh, Jurich will be tied by Gavin Yates, and probably sometime next weekend, Gavin Yates will be in the top five of games played in a Binghamton Black Bears uniform. Now, when we look at goals, we know that goals is Nikita Ivashkin with 105, but Tyler Jurich is in second place with 87 goals in his career as a Binghamton Black Bear. I'm sorry, that was... Tyler Jurich, Tyson Kirkby has 53, Gavin Yates has 45, and Austin Thompson is in the top five with 36 goals scored by Thompson in his Binghamton Black Bears career. Now, when we look at assists, Kyle Powell is sitting at number one with 94 assists. Nikita Ivashkin has 84. I would expect that he would probably uh, beat that out. Uh, Tyler Jurich has 80. Gavin Yates is 73. Tyson Kirkby is with 65. So you're pretty much going to expect who is in the top for points. Nikita Ivashkin with 189 points. Uh, That is also 15th best right now in the Binghamton Hockey points. So he's he's starting to creep up there, right? He's he's getting up there in points, and he's going to be in the top 15 here pretty quickly. He's 16th right now. Tyler Jurich is 167 points. And then Tyson Kirkby and Gavin Yates are tied right now with 118 points. So you got third and fourth place. And the only reason why Tyson's in third, he scored more goals with 53 versus Gavin Yates, 45. Kyle Powell has 106 points. And uh, then we go to the penalty minutes, right? Matthew Boylard has 306 penalty minutes in 102 games played. Uh, MJ Merkel's numbers are a little bit more, I guess, impressive in the sense he's probably had more fights than uh, Matthew Boylard. Um, he's played only 48 games for the Binghamton Black Bears and has 211 penalty minutes. If you break that down, it's about 4.6 penalty minutes. So he's probably got a few more fighting majors in there than Boylard does. But Boylard has taken a few of those 10-minute misconducts, which kind of adds up pretty quickly. Uh, Nikita Ivochkin has 200 penalty minutes. For him, it's mostly minors, and he's had, obviously, the few games where he had a couple 10-minute misconducts. Tyson Kirkby has 175 in 87 games, and Gavin Yates has 90 games played with 148 penalty minutes. So it's a pretty cool page. Go check it out and see these types of things that we do produce and put on BinghamtonHockey.net's uh, webpage. Uh, I think I also added recently Connor McAnanima's profile to BinghamtonHockey.net as well. So you can see his game logs and his stats as well, uh, which is pretty cool. And so I just wanted to bring that up and let people know this is the kind of stuff that we provide. We archive all the Binghamton uh, Black Bears press releases and things of that nature. So they're up there. On the left-hand side, there's an Empire uh, standings and the stats that you can see as well, especially if you're looking at it on the desktop version. If you're looking on mobile, things get changed up and moved around uh, 
but please check it out. Um, you know, I haven't done a really strong push on BinghamtonHockey.net, um, but I wanted to make sure that you guys were completely aware of it. So let's talk a little bit about this past weekend with the Binghamton Black Bears. They had an okay weekend. I don't want to say that it was horrible, but there were moments in the three games where it seemed like they may have taken the foot off the gas a little bit, right? Uh, maybe in the Elmira game where they won 7-3, to three, they might have done that just a little bit. Then we saw it a little bit in Danbury, and we definitely saw it in Binghamton on New Year's Eve where when they were up 3 to nothing, which was great. I think the fans, you were starting to get the fans in it, and then it just seemed like they kind of backed off a little bit. And I know that in the Danbury game, there was a late penalty that the Hattricks took. And in that penalty, they they seem to they seem to not really go for the the kill, right? And uh, it might have been in the second period. And I just noticed I was like, wait a second here, you know, they're on the power play and they keep backing up and backing up and backing up and they were playing keep away a little bit. And I was really concerned about that. I was like, why are they doing this? And uh, it seemed to be kind of something. Now, we talked to Coach Sherwood. You're going to hear that interview in just a little bit. And I think he had some of those similar feelings as well. But let's talk a little bit about the first game against the Elmira River Sharks. The uh, the Black Bears um, started off. They got goals from Andrew Logar and then Dakota Bond on the power play. And by the way, Dakota Bond and Andrew Logar are kind of creeping up there in the power play goals and uh, those type of things, which is which is pretty good for the Black Bears. I did write about in one of my uh, day after game reports about secondary scoring, and Andrew Logar is a part of that. Dakota Bond is a part of that. And I think it's really good stuff. So check that out. If you haven't seen my day after game reports this past weekend, go check them out. There's some good information, good analysis in there that I think is really important. Secondary scoring is honestly one of the most important things in hockey for teams to win championships. If you have your top line or your top goal scorers scoring about 36 to 40% of your goals and the rest is spread out, distributed amongst the rest of the team, what's important is that you still get that kind of scoring when you go into the playoffs, right? You still want your goal, your goal scorers to get that 36 to 40% of your scoring, and then the rest of it needs to be spread out. The nice thing about the Binghamton Black Bears, going into this weekend, there's probably only going to be one player that hasn't scored a goal for them, and that person just hasn't joined the team yet, but is expected to. And I don't need to name names. You know who I'm talking about, right? So just just to understand that um, – When that person gets a goal, every person on the Binghamton Black Bears will then have a goal scored, and it's spread out pretty good. That's why this team is special. It's because you have three guys that are scoring the bulk of your uh, uh, 36 to 40% of your goals, which in this case, the Black Bears, 40% of their goals is coming from three guys. Tyson Kirkby, Connor Smith, and Nikita Ivashkin. The rest is spread out amongst everybody else. And and when you look at the numbers, and uh, well, let me get off of Motor City, who is our opponent this upcoming week. But when you look at Connor Smith, Tyson Kirkby, and Nikita Ivochkin, now they, they normally, the three of them are on different lines. Okay. See, now I'm going off into a tangent about secondary scoring, but this is very important, right? It's spread out so well on this team. And that's so important, right? Jesse Anderson only has two, but he has 21 assists. He's he's been in a a different role this year. I'm not going to count. I'm not going to say that two goals is bad for Jesse Anderson. It's not. He's he's also been a part of 23 different goals that have been scored by the Black Bears this year. Two that he scored in 21 assists. That's not bad. It's not bad at all, right? But you have Dakota Bond with six goals. Five of those are on the power play. So he's chipping in in an important part of the game. Donald Oliveri has eight goals. He has three power play goals, and he's done that in 10 games. 
Gavin Yates has seven goals. Austin Thompson has seven goals. Andrew Logar has seven goals. Thomas Ray has seven goals. Josh Fletcher has six goals. Okay. You know, Matthew Ballard, we, we don't expect him to score a lot of goals. He's not there for that reason, right? Justin Samaro, three goals. Daniel Stone, two goals. Liam Anderson even has a goal, and so does JT Walters. And you don't expect those guys to be scoring goals, but they at least have one, one each, along with Matthew Ballard. Your team is stacked from top to bottom being able to score goals. Secondary scoring is so very important. This team has it. No other team has every single member on their team with a goal. Now, granted, it's going to change for Binghamton in a couple days when someone else joins this team, okay? And so you you have to understand this is good. This is exactly what you want to see. No, Connor Smith and Tyson Kirkby and Nikita Ivashin are probably not going to win the scoring title in the FPHL at the end of the year, but they don't have to because if every single person on this team puts a couple pucks or 10 pucks, I mean, if you think about it, they have three guys with 10 goals or more. Within a few weeks, you could have Donald Oliveri at 10 goals. You could have Gavin Yates at 10 goals. You could have Austin Thompson at 10 goals. You could have Andrew Logar, Thomas Ray at 10 goals. That's pretty awesome. That's, that's, that's where not one line, not two lines, not three lines, but all the lines are scoring. Everybody, you know, Josh Fletcher and Andrew Logar, every single night, are on that third line on the, you know, the when the do the lineup card, right? Always down at the bottom. And they have 13 goals between the two of them. And then Samaro has three. Tommy Ray has seven. All from that, what we would consider the checking line or the, the gritty line, whatever you want to call it. The Black Bears have scoring from top to bottom. That's pretty awesome. And, obviously, a couple guys on D that can do it as well. They can score goals. Dakota Bond is really strict. I mean, Dakota Bond is going to get a look-see by the SPHL next year. I really, really think so. Like a stronger look. I mean, he's proving himself here that he can be a power play specialist. So, when you look at these last – now, with what I just said, and then you look at these last three games, the Black Bears are going to be fine. I got no problems with them. They won the game in Elmira. They needed to win that game. Andrew Logar had a power play goal. Dakota Bond had a power play goal. At the end of the game, Nikita Ivashkin, he chipped in with a power play goal, right? So, um, you know, Andrew Logar had two goals in the game. Dakota Bond had two goals in the game. Nikita Ivashkin had two goals in the game. That was a good game. Right, they they dominated that. They dominated Elmira, even though I think Elmira had their moments in the game. Okay, you put Tyler Jurich in that game because I don't think he beca- he became a standard contracted player. I think on Saturday, right? But you put him in that game, and maybe the game's a little bit different. Maybe one another extra goal for them. He's got a great shot, just like Donald Oliveri. So then you go to Danbury, right? So the team obviously plays in Elmira, comes home, sleeps in their own bed, gets up, and then they drive down to Danbury for the game. And obviously we all know this game went to overtime, and the Black Bears lost in overtime. But what's interesting about this game is they start off with three straight goals. Tyson Kirkby, Donald Oliveri, and Nikita Ivashkin. Then the Hattricks take a timeout, reset themselves, and Johnny Ruiz, who I asked coach this, and you'll hear this a little bit later on. I said, listen, you got to say something nice about the Danbury hat tricks. And then I asked him about Johnny Ruiz. 12 seconds after Nikita Ivashkin scores the third, go- the, uh, the, the third goal, right? Second power play goal on a double minor that happened. Johnny Ruiz, they take a timeout. Johnny Ruiz goes out there and scores a goal 12 seconds later because that's what good players do. And he and he is a good player. You don't have to like Danbury 
but you can certainly respect Johnny Ruiz and the way he plays the game. And he plays the game right a lot of the times, most of the time, if not all the times. And then three minutes later, just shy of three minutes later, another shift out there, and he's just you know, doing what he does, and he scores another goal. And I, this is how I feel about it. Once he scored that second goal, this game was over. I, I know I know that sounds like, oh, you know, what am I saying, right? But the momentum was there the whole game now from then out for the hat tricks. And this was a great game. Don't get me wrong. This is a great game. Danbury then scores another two goals. They're up 4-3, right? And, and doing what Black Bears do the best, they get another goal from the third line. Justin Samaro. Scores a goal, 14-11, into the third period, right? You think it's over, it's done, it's out. They get like nine straight shots, I think it was, something, something to that effect. I, if I go back to the actual play-by-play and whatnot, I'm pretty sure it was like nine or, or so uh, shots, you know? It started at the 12-minute mark with uh, Trout in for a high-sticking penalty. And then all of a sudden, 20 seconds later, they get that first shot on goal. And then they basically get every single shot on goal. Fourteen shots on goal. I had to count it. Sorry about that, guys. Fourteen shots on goal. I did mention this in my day after game report. They basically, from then on, from that penalty, which they only got mm, two Two, two shots on goal during the power play, right? They didn't score the goal then. Four shots later, about another two minutes later after, you know, not that far after, Justin Samaro gets the goal. And then they continue to plug away because that's what this team does. So even on their, not their best night, because this wasn't their best night, good game. I thought both teams played clean, played very well. I, I really did like that. Some sloppy play maybe by the Black Bears at times. But then so did Danbury. Danbury had some sloppy play. But then you get to the end of this game and they kind of took over. And they were looking and looking and looking and looking. But unfortunately, Liam Murray was just at that point playing well. Right? He'd only given up four goals. The Black Bears' uh, uh, Sam Levici only gave up four goals. And then they go into the overtime. Right, and in the overtime, there's a Donald Oliveri. Well, there's a too many men on the ice served by Donald Oliveri, which they got in the third period. So that's a little sloppy. So maybe not thinking. Maybe they were tired, exhausted, whatever it might be. Might have been. Doesn't matter. It was real. It happened. Same thing in the third period. If they called it in the third period and they didn't call it in the overtime, I that's. BS, right? And Dan Barry would have every right to, you know, have a problem with it. But if they don't call it in the third period and they don't call it in the overtime, I'm fine with that as well. But they called it in both periods. So it is what it is. And then they get the power play goal to win the game. And it's their first win in like seven tries against Binghamton, right? So you got to give them credit. They, they fought back. Then you get to the game on New Year's Eve, right? And this game, I thought, you know, you'll, you'll hear, hear the comments from Coach Sherwood in just a little bit and everything. But uh, I, I, I thought it was I thought it was coming. I, I thought it started off okay. Danbury gets the first goal on the power play, right? And then you get three straight goals from the Black Bears, right? And it took a long time in between those goals, right? Uh, Black Bears scored 9.42 of the first period to tie it up with Josh Fletcher getting a goal. And then it was 14.28. So about five minutes later, they get another goal from Tyson Kirkby, right? Then 19.39 in the period, uh, second period, they get a goal from Thomas Ray. Tom, so basically that second period, there really wasn't much happening. Uh, a lot of back and forth play. Some shots on goal happened. Fourteen, fourteen. The the middle period was probably the most even played period by both teams in both days. And uh, the the shots on goal proved that. And then uh, Thomas Ray got that goal at the end of the third, at the end of the second. So you 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 
you're going into the third period at home on New Year's Eve, full crowd. 4,893 people were in attendance. And then the second period, or the third period, the Black Bears just got beat. They just got beat. It's really what it comes down to. Connor McAnanima got beat for two goals uh, by Jacob Ratcliffe and Kyle Heitzer. Heitzner beat him. It's just that simple. They play into the overtime period. And again, in the overtime period, this time, for this particular game, this was all about the Black Bears. You know, a couple shots by the uh, Danbury Hattricks. The um, Jared Yao goes in for, well, he gets a 10-minute. Well, Johnny Ruiz gets a slashing penalty 20 seconds in, right? And um, the, the Hattricks still got two shots on goal. But then it turned to the Black Bears. And the Black Bears started to dominate the overtime. But it came down to nobody scored. Jared Yao gets pissed off at one point and verbal abuse of the official, 10 minutes. So he's out. And then they go to the shootout. And in the shootout, again, Dan Barry scores a goal. We don't. They win the game. Okay? And I asked Coach about this at the end of the interview. you got to listen to the end of the interview. You'll hear him. Uh, I'll say, are you worried for your team when you go into a shootout. And he said, absolutely yes. There was It was so definitive, he didn't even think about it. He didn't try to sugarcoat it. He basically said yes. And they've been working on it this week. couple more drills being put into practice to try to work on this. He knows. He sees it. He sees what I see. And I saw in the first couple. They're, they don't even feel comfortable going down and trying to take those shots. And I can ask players all day long, and they'll they'll say one thing or another, but that's what coaches and media are supposed to do. We're supposed to critique a little bit. And the one thing, if this is the one thing, he's okay with it, but he really wants to fix it because he doesn't like to lose. And you'll hear him say that in a little bit, right? But he doesn't want to lose because of a shootout. He'd rather win before the shootout, three on three in the overtime, or even in regulation, he'd rather win. He does not like to lose. So that was basically the weekend. I don't think the weekend was horrible. They got points in every single game. Understand this. This is another thing I talked about in one of my day after game reports. The Black Bears have won 12 games at home, and they've only lost two games in the shootout at home. They are 12-0-2. Those are great numbers. This is what you build on to get to the championship. So um, that's pretty cool. So the next thing I'm going to go over real quick is the Motor City Rockers. Okay? The Motor City Rockers are coming in on Saturday. It's the only game for the Black Bears this weekend. If you're going to the game, be safe. It's going to be a little bit of snow out there. It's going to actually finally feel like hockey season and, and look like hockey season with some snow. And in the Binghamton area, there is snow projected um, that will start sometime in the afternoon and get heavier in the overnight. There's your weather forecast. Um, you don't need to go anywhere else. I'll give it to you right here on the Power Play Post Show. But either way, Motor City is coming into town. Now, what do we know about Motor City? Well, we know that they're second place right now in the Empire Division, right? They got moved over a few games into the season. FPHL made a decision to take them from the Continental, move them over into the Empire, which makes more sense because Binghamton at least plays against them. Danbury plays against them. And I'm pretty sure Watertown and Elmira do as well. Um, they are 11. They're actually 13 five and four in 22 games. They started off really, really, really good. And even though they've tailed off just a tiny bit, they are still one of the stronger teams in the league. They have a similar defense and goaltending situation as we do. I th- although I think we have three very good goaltenders. They have Trevor Babin, right? They don't score as much as the Black Bears do, but they're not that far behind. We've scored 112 goals in a, in a, in a season in 24 games. They've scored 93. I think the average between us is 4.2 goals average for them. And the Black Bears, I'm pretty sure it's 4.7. So 
you have to understand the we're not that they're not that far off from the Black Bears. Um, so they've won their last two games. They did lose, unfortunately for them, not for us. Unfortunately for them, they have lost Trevor Babin. He's been suspended for three games. They do play Monday or Friday night before they come to Binghamton. They will play, I believe, in Watertown, and then they travel down to Binghamton for a game on Saturday night at seven o'clock. This is a good team. You'll be surprised on the way they play. Uh, Declan Conway has 11 goals, 9 assists for 20 points. Okay, They have Jameson, Jameson Milan. He has 4 goals and 15 assists and 19 points. A lot of their guys who score, they, see, they have some secondary scoring qualities as well. It's not all just the top 3 or 4 guys. They have scoring spread out amongst it. Not as prevalent as the Black Bears, but pretty good as well. Okay. So what does that mean for goaltending, right? They do have Ricardo Gonzalez, who will probably, I would imagine, get the two starts this weekend unless they bring somebody else in. Right now, they only have one goalie on their, their roster because Trevor Babin is um, – is, suspended and he will be suspended i believe he'll be able to come back next weekend against withville in the second game against withville because there's a friday night game against withville and then a saturday game against withville and so trevor babin can come back for that game but he won't be able to play at all this weekend or friday next week against withville so ricardo gonzalez i would imagine is going to get both starts he's four and three on the season with a uh, 3.33 goals against average and a 91 save percentage. So he's he's played just over he's played just over six full games and uh, I think without a doubt he'll be he'll be fine. They've got a decent defense. When you look up and down this roster, there's only a couple guys with negative numbers when it comes to their plus minus and that tells the story right there. Right, everybody's on the ice. Most guys are chipping in and 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 helping defensively. Uh, they're good two way forwards as well. So that's what's coming up this weekend, Friday night um, against the Motor City Rockers. I do want to bring up one thing. I'm going to talk about it for a few seconds. As everybody knows, on December 28th, the FPHL made Jake uh, Schultz active. Right, we all saw it. We also saw that on the 26th, he failed to report. Okay, he was released from his ECHL contract in Worcester, and because of that, the FPHL says you've got to either activate him, uh, sign him, or whatever. Uh, the Black Bears put him on the failed to report. So, in other words, they got in contact with Jake. Said, "Hey, are you coming down here?" He said, no, but I would like to, and then, you know, talk to the team about it. Um, And I think it's taken a couple weeks for them to figure things out because it's Jake Schultz. He just played in the ECHL, and there's nothing against thinking that you can play at the next level because I do think he could play at the next level. Worcester got some guys back, and so they obviously made some changes and decided to let Jake go. Okay, so he was available. Um, the situation is this. It's going to probably come to a head sometime on Friday. We'll know for sure everything that's happening with Jake Schultz. Um, and uh, But I can tell you that um, Coach, he's not going to talk about it in the interview. Um, I, I wouldn't say it was an off seas conversation, but I'm not going to put uh, that kind of pressure on him to answer that question. I will tell you this. There have been conversations between Jake Schultz and the Binghamton Black Bears, and I think we're going to see the result of that probably on Friday, right? So that's pretty much it. Um, I, I want to now hand it off to the uh, to the interview uh, with Coach uh, Brant Sherwood. Very good interview. I think you guys are going to enjoy it. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and uh, thank you very much 
for everything in 2023, accepting me back into the podcasting world. I really do appreciate it. Uh, but coming up next here on the Power Play Post Show, he is the head coach of the Binghamton Black Bears. He's Brant Sherwood. We'll be right back right after this, right here on the Power Play Post Show. You're listening to the Power Play Post Show. Here is another Power Play Post Show interview exclusive with Bob Howard. And welcome back, everybody, to the Power Play Post Show. First guest for 2024. Makes complete perfect sense. We've already seen the 2023 portion of the schedule completed. We've already seen 50% of the home games completed for the Binghamton Black Bears. So I figured, why not bring in coach Sherwood to have another conversation to see how the first half of this season has gone for his squad. Uh, so coach, welcome back to the show. It's always great to talk to you. I think we, sometimes we talk 15, 20 minutes before we even get rolling in these interviews sometimes. Um, but it's just great to hear your voice again. Hey, well, uh, thanks for having me back. Excited, uh, excited to join today. So let's, let's talk a little bit about this season so far, because some of the numbers out there at home, 14 games so far, that's the halfway point for the home games. You guys are 12, 0 and two. You have not lost in regulation at home and your only two regulation uh, losses have been on the road. I think one in Elmira, one in Watertown. If I, if I remember correctly, uh, or actually down in Carolina, uh, uh, Winston Salem, talk a little bit about the home ice advantage that you guys have here in Binghamton. Well, we just feed off the energy of the fans. And, um, you know, uh, I think everyone knows about our locker room and our setup. And it's uh, it's a nice, uh, comfy country club in here. These it boys is. work hard, but uh, they get treated very well. And that's kudos to uh, the arena and Andreas for taking care of these guys. Uh, even just, like, having breakfast at the rink uh, every day. It's, it's awesome. And um, it's uh, all thanks to... Uh, our uh, fans and um, our owner, Andreas, for uh, kind of having this set up. And, it's, uh, yeah, it's been great playing at home. It's awesome. How's the leadership been for this team? Um, obviously, you're the main point. You're the, you're the number one leader on this team. Um, but talk a little bit about Tyson Kirkby, JT Walters, and, and your captains. Uh, what, is it, ha, what has it been about these guys so far that you think has helped make this team click? Because it starts with leadership first, in my opinion. Yeah, so uh, Tyson, he's he's my right hand man. Um, I bounce a lot of ideas off him. I'll even I'll go over lines, D pairs, um, power play units, and uh, kind of pick his brain, see what he's thinking, and then uh, just his voice in the locker room um, and his actions on the ice. So like, he'll say something and then he'll back it up uh, with his next shift. And it, his hockey IQ is it's. I don't know, right up there with mine. It's probably past mine by now, but uh, he uh, is such a smart player, and he's just uh, someone that the guys can learn from. And then with uh, with Jesse and Wally, they're yeah. just kind of that common presence. Like, Jesse, he's uh, just a utility knife. Like, he, <laughs> he, can, he can do just about anything. He, I'm surprised I haven't put him in net yet, but um, <laughs> just a total soldier. And uh, he's moving back up to forward this week. And yeah. he, I, I ask him, like, what do you prefer? What do you want? And he's like, whatever, wherever you need me, coach. So just having a guy like that is amazing. And then uh, Wally. Wally's just like, he's a guy that's, hey, bringing, bringing everyone back down to earth and uh, making sure, like, things are staying even keel. And uh, he, he really handles the back end of things, too. So um, when guys need pointers or tips uh, on the defensive end, he's uh, he's right there for them. And um, a lot of a lot of the time on Wednesday, I guess now Thursday practices, he'll grab the D for a while mm-hmm. and uh, he'll run him through uh, some drills. We just uh, we need to get uh, C Mac that coaching title. 
for uh, the goaltending part, though. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I talked to Connor McAnanima um, on the show a couple weeks ago, and he, he talked to me about how he he does bring Sam and, and Nolan together and, and, and kind of coaches them a little bit. It's something he did before he joined the Binghamton Black Bears. Because I, I asked him, because he was the first goaltender we had on the show, and I said, well, who coaches you guys? And he goes, well, kind of I do, I guess. So is, it, it must be kind of nice to be able to have a guy like Connor who he did this just a little bit. It, it, it was just a taste. You know, it's not like he's been coaching for a long time, but he did it for a little bit. That must help you and just the team knowing that you got a guy that can see certain things and help uh, educate the other two guys. 100%. And he's, uh, he'll, like, point out some things, and it's just suggestions like mm-hmm. – uh, Aggie and Sam, they they know what they're doing, and they've had plenty of training and stuff, but um, I think they all kind of help each other and point out some uh, different tendencies, and um, it's, uh, it's, been, it's been extremely helpful to have those guys kind of running it themselves, and um, I'm not no goalie expert, but just them kind of having a little background in uh, goalie coaching is absolutely huge, and that's kind of how i got uh connor Mm -hmm. um i worked at this camp up in uh new hampton prep school uh for a few summers and the hockey director over there called me and told me he had a guy heard from another uh camp coach there and it kind of was like yeah let's let's make this work so um yeah that was he he took a year off of hockey and was just coaching and look what he's doing now it's it's awesome it's uh it just shows you that you can never really count someone out if uh, they they really want to follow their dream. Now, I, I, I know that sometimes coaches, you know, you kind of have to keep a little bit of space between yourself and your players, and you kind of probably use Tyson Kirkby to, you know, communicate sometimes if you don't communicate directly uh, with, with players and everything. But one of the things I was talking about with Connor McAnanimo when we had him on the show was that he and Eggie and uh, Sam are really, really close. They're super tight. And, yes, there's probably a competition to get on the ice, but these guys are like, I mean, in his words, they said best friends. Um, That must be really nice that you don't have guys going after each other to try to get on ice. They're probably the best of friends and trying to help each other when they are on the ice. Yeah, I mean, I've I've played with a few goalies. Uh, Shout out to Brad Barone. Um, You were never allowed to go in his net if you were a second (laughs) or third goalie. So, yeah, he'd he'd fight you for uh, for that space. But um, I I don't mind it. I don't mind it at all. I I I love having competition. I I want guys to own that net. But at the same time. We have such great uh, camaraderie with with everyone in the room, and it's nice to see it with the goalies. Going into this year, I, I kind of didn't want that, sure. but um, they're they're doing it well because we had that last year with the goalies. They they're all uh, they're all like best friends and stuff. But um, Taylor did a great job and kind of took the number one role over. But um, you know, I I. I do want to find that number one, and I really think we uh, we did that this year with uh, Connor. So he's running with it. But goalies, it's uh, it's a different world, mm-hmm. and um, you know they could have a good five games, they could have a, a bad game there, and another guy comes in, and he gets hot. Uh, it's there's not too many Velaskis or uh, Bobrovskis yeah. or Shcherkins out there. You you usually have a tandem and. You never know how it's going to go. Look at the biggest Golden Knights last year. I think they had like four goalies for playoffs. So you mm-hmm. do need to have depth in, uh, in that position. So let me let me ask you this. On December 23rd, just before Christmas, you were able to give the goaltenders really an early Christmas gift, and that was basically, hey, we're really down on players, and we really need to dress all three of you. <laughs> I got to imagine, and I, I and I said this on the show, and and I truly believe this. That must have been a special moment for both, for all three goaltenders to be able to come in and go. We're all three dressing, and and that, that had to be a kind of a cool moment for really kind of everybody involved. And, and I know sometimes you, you can't step back and take a look at things when you're in the heat of it, but it's a pretty cool thing. It's amazing, and like the fact that that happened, it, it is pretty cool, and. uh 
it's funny because that I we were playing Watertown that weekend, yep. and that Friday night game, I did not like our game. I mm-hmm. I it almost felt like a loss in our room. <laughs> really, <laughs> the way I talked to these guys after, I was like, I'm I'm a little disappointed in everyone in the way they played because um, I thought I'll. Or I thought Watertown had a bunch of chances, and uh, we gave up too many odd man rushes. Sure. And I, I didn't think we were too too hungry that night. And um, the next morning, guys are sick. Uh, a couple guys hurt. I'm like, I'm like thinking, how the hell are we going to pull this off? <laughs> and Don Oliveri comes into my office, and he's like, Hey. Mac Anonima is uh he's on the ice playing player right now like he he whispered in my ear and told me to ask you like is is there any shot and I was like so right on the spot I was like let's do it let's do it because it, it, it was very dull in our room and like yeah we were winning a bunch of games and stuff but it was just like the perfect shake up sure and I, I went out to the optional skate. I'm like, hey, you're going tonight. And uh, I had to call Don Kernan first to see if it was, like, even legal. <laughs> Did um, you really? He gave me the approval. Okay. And uh, he's like, yeah, no problem. You can, you can start him and stuff. And it was uh, <laughs> it was awesome just seeing him in the goalie jersey. Yes. And I didn't know if I was going to actually put him out there. but Okay, so. Our, so, we, so are, we are having so much fun on the bench. And yeah. The boys were kind of agging me on, like, come on, he needs a shift. And they're like, they're staying in in the first period. I'm like, no, no, not a chance. Like, <laughs> in my mind, I was like, offensive uh, zone draw, maybe get him out there, tell him to take 15 seconds and then get the hell off because that'll be uh, you don't... getting hurt. Well, yeah, exactly. And uh, Tom, Tom was, he was saying no, too. He's like, don't, don't let him do it. And, <laughs> I me me and Tom like got fingers crossed. We were we were uh, I was sweating that uh, nothing would happen because you know I that that would look very bad yeah. on the team's part if something bad happened. But um, what an amazing moment! <laughs> Somehow he gets a assist out of it. He yes. tips the puck or something. It might be a little bit of a phantom, but so happy <laughs> to uh, see him get on the score sheet and then watch the boys kind of rally around him and then seeing the goalie celebrate at the end. It it truly was special. Was it was it was there any like su- was there any kind of surprise when when um I think it was J T Walters decided to get every penalty he could in one moment that he's had all season, all in one shot, and you had to actually put him in the penalty box and he gets out onto the ice, <laughs> skates across the fans cheer like crazy. They cheered for a guy going to the penalty box, and everything. Were you kind of were you surprised? Were you like, "Holy crap! These 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 people in Binghamton just understand what's going on." And it, it must have been a pretty cool thing that you heard them cheering for Connor going over to the penalty box. Yeah, I think pretty much the whole bench was <laughs> like we're laugh, we're excited, but we were laughing, and uh, it's just. It just goes to show you that uh, how passionate this town is for hockey, sure, and um, how attentive they are. They they know who the guys are, and um, I think what plays a part in that is not not having a revolving door here. Like, yeah, there hasn't been too much player movement, and uh, even some of the player movement that we've had. Like, I, I brought Samaro back, and look at him now, oh, and that. how that third line's doing, and. Um, yeah, it's it's just cool. It's really cool to keep a team around like that because you don't see that in pro hockey often, and uh, it's um, that's what makes this group so special. Is that we've uh, stuck together for like the past three months, and you, you really get to know each other and develop uh, chemistry on and off the ice. One of the things that I said um, during the stretch where. You know, uh, you, you have somebody sick. Connor Smith was out for a little bit. Uh, Nikita had his, uh, um, his suspension and everything. One of the things I said yeah. was is the great thing about Andrew Logar, Josh Fletcher, Thomas Ray, and Justin Samaro is that all four of those guys 
are the ideal utility players where you could pluck them from the third line and put them in a spot on the first or second line, and it seems to work. How fortunate do you feel about those four players being the bottom end of the, that those forwards, but it's not really a bottom end. They're like just these great utility players that can just do anything that you want. And, and I talked to Andrew Logar about this, and he said, listen, I'll just do whatever coach asked me to do. That just you know, shows the character these guys have and uh, how lucky we are to have those type of people in our room that are willing to be selfless and put the team first. And, like, I, I shook up the lines a little bit this week, and it's kind of like we I, – I know at the beginning of the year I said three first lines, but it kind of feels like three second lines, which is which is also great for me um, in, the, in the squad because – you know, we we got a little grit on each line. We got sure. some skill, little mix of uh, of everything. So yeah, it's um, it's awesome to see those guys progress. Like uh, they they might not have been the prettiest hockey players at the beginning of the year, mm-hmm. but once they start building that confidence, um, you see that like they do have the skill of Tyson Kirkby. They do have the skill of Gavin Yates or Connor Smith. Um, it was just a matter of pulling it out of them and giving them the minutes, and they they had to battle for those minutes, especially Andrew Logar. I think he's the one that comes off the page the most. Is just like his poise and uh, puck protection is uh, it's one of the top in the league, and that's why he's on one of the power plays and mm-hmm. why the. <laughs> The, the whole team loves him because uh, he's got that skill, but then he's got that nasty mean side to him that uh, kind of gets the boys going. You know, one of the things that he said to me in the uh, interview, or he might have said it to me uh, before the interview started, was he got he got a 10-minute misconduct at the end of one of the games and everything, and I said to him, I said, what did you say? Did you, did you drop the magic worker? He goes, no, the referee knew I wanted a fight, and he was getting me out of there before <laughs> – I took matters into my own hand. And I love that because, you know, again, you really want guys that will go to the edge but not necessarily go over it. And I think Andrew Logar is one of those guys that can can get to the edge because he realizes that other teams are taking liberties on the, either their best, your guys' best players or something to that effect and everything. He's willing to go there. He's willing to get to that point if need be for the team. 100%. That's kind of what I tell these guys. Uh, from I, I was one of those guys. And just uh, Even in the Fed, I was one of those guys. I, I had to earn my minutes, and uh, then the skill would come about. But um, in order to buy myself time at each level, I bought and I got underneath the uh, opposing team's skin. And that's exactly what they're doing. And I'll tell them, like, hey, if they if they don't know your name when they're going back to the bench and talking about you, you probably didn't do your job. Yeah. And right now, I think uh, the entire league is aware of Josh Fletcher, Andrew Logar, uh, Justin Samaro. I, I did pull Ray aside. I think he could use a little more snot in his game or snarl. Mm-hmm. Um, to kind of join with those boys, but uh, he's another guy that's like given li- limited minutes, and uh, he's really taken advantage of them. So yeah. it it really is just uh, it's a uh, it's a note to their character. Coach, they're, they're really good guys, and they're willing to sacrifice for the team. Yeah, coach, I'm going to ask you to say something nice about Danbury for a second, and I I, I know this is very tough for you. <laughs> this is very difficult. This yeah. is very difficult. But Johnny Ryu, Ryu, Ruiz on, uh, I think it was Friday night, um, no Saturday night in Danbury, uh, there was a timeout. You guys were up three nothing, and I know these two games against Danbury are probably games you guys are you know played back a little bit, maybe watched a little video, maybe discussed a little bit. He seemed to take the game a little bit on his shoulders for the hat tricks. Now, the hat tricks were really good, physical, maybe to the point of almost dirty. That's my words, not your words. Last year, they won the championship. This year, a lot of change. A lot of things have changed and everything. But Johnny Ruiz is still 
one of the best players in the league, probably one of the more skilled guys on that team, and probably gets the most respect of any of the players that have ever played on that team. Can you talk to me a little bit about that Saturday night game? They call the timeout after you guys went up 3 nothing, and then it was I think it was 12 seconds later, Johnny Ruiz scores a goal, and the game almost seemed different after that. Yeah, good uh, good coaching call on Kyle Gonzalez. Not, yeah, not a bad uh, not a bad play for a guy that's uh, <laughs> substituting behind the bench. But um, yeah, so uh, to be honest, um, I didn't think Johnny uh, Ruiz was the same player he was last year. Sure, at least in uh, the previous games we played against them, and that exact shift you're talking about, mm-hmm. uh, Tom. Tom and I look at each other and goes, "Here comes Johnny," and you could you could just see the motor on him. Like, yeah, he he had an intensity about him that uh, you know caught us sleeping, and we weren't ready for it. We thought we were going to run him out of the building. And Danbury is they're known for that. They're known for hanging around games and just staying in the fight, but um, they're also known for slow starts. And we've been taking advantage of them on the slow starts, but for some reason we get a little complacent and let off the gas. And Johnny has two shifts in a row where he kind of takes over individually, and um, it really bites us. And you know, you go into uh, I believe the second period, three-two instead of up three-nothing, and that's uh, it's a very different game. Then you know, kind of have a tough stretch in the second period, and. Yeah, you you got we we claw back, and that's one great yeah. thing about our team is like you you can never count us out. And nope. I know we were on top there, but even in a five one game where we're down, um, or team comes back on us, I, I still wouldn't count us out. We can really uh, I don't want to say flick the switch, but um, we can really turn it on at any moment. They just you know, need to be reminded uh, sometimes. But, yeah, Johnny is a great great hockey player, really good on draws, and uh, he's very tenacious out there. Um, I I definitely respect him, and I I respect Billy. I respect uh, a lot of guys over there. I just don't respect their hospitality and the way they treat uh, away teams. Sorry, I just had to get it in there. No, that's It's something the league needs to clean up, and it's, uh, it's very frustrating. It's very understandable. I'm not going to ask you to talk about the incident and everything um, that happened. Uh, but obviously, you know, you can respect some of the players on the ice. You can respect Billy McCurry, who I think is actually a very smart coach. I think he's a very uh, talented uh, coach. I'd love to see what he could do somewhere else other than Danbury. I'm not saying Binghamton. I'm saying just anywhere else other than Danbury to see if he does have the skill that I I think that he has because it's like if you're given Daniel Ansbury, you're going to use him in a way that's going to benefit you. Other people may not like it, but he understands people's roles and stuff like that. Let me ask you this, though. It has been a weird season, maybe for you. You've been fined twice by the league uh, for, you know, whatever. There was the incident with Danbury, obviously, and then, of course, the the incident with Watertown. When it comes to Verbreek and what really was going down in that situation, I, I, I felt like, from my vantage point, you were trying to stop everything. And I'm not asking you to really get into the details because I know you can get in trouble with the league. And, and yes, I realize that and everything. But sometimes, even when you're doing the right things, you get punished for it. Yeah, and um, it's more so for the guys. Yeah. Like, not the, the Danbury stuff. I don't even, like, half the guys don't even know that situation. Right. I mean, right. they, they probably hear rumbles of it from uh, – our captains and stuff, but, like, I don't involve them in that. But as far as the Watertown, um, he just, if, I don't know if he said it or if their players just jump, but when their whole bench clears onto the ice, like, and I'm keeping my guys back, yeah, like, I'm I'm going to say something and uh, make it be known that that's, that's Bush League and the unacceptable and, uh, dangerous and kind of what the Fed is trying to get away from um, and be kind of that legitimate uh, league that um, I think everyone wants it to be and I think 
Sarge, Don, and all the governors are doing a great job at it. Uh, Barry, uh, even like uh, Jeff Krupp, Donald yeah. Columbus, yeah. Uh, Andreas, like everyone sees the potential and how much it's progressed over the past three years. So you just kind of want to get away from those things. And yeah, it's uh, it's unfortunate because like you don't want to be looked at that way mm-hmm. anymore. And all it takes is one video of that. And it's like, oh, look at that gong show down there. Um, it's just a goon league, like we were talking about off the air, and it's uh, it's totally not that anymore. No, I totally agree with you. Let's talk a little bit about Carolina. You guys played four games against them. They and Columbus are the top two teams in the Continental Division. Uh, basically a split. I think you guys got one extra point uh, based on the uh, the shootout loss, if I remember correctly. Um, talk a little yep. bit about Carolina, and uh, is that a matchup you may look forward to in the finals, or you know maybe Columbus because they haven't seen you and you haven't seen them? I would, I, personally, I'd like to play uh, Columbus because, you know, I got some history there. And, sure. Uh, I'm really good friends with Jerome and uh, the Croups and uh, a couple guys that are still kicking around there, Austin, uh, Austin Doe and um, Josh Petro, Antonio, um, just really good guys. I think it'd be fun to, to play against them and, uh, you know, uh, see what, See how we match up, but at the same time, like it could be either one of those teams. And I don't want to count out the other teams, but I do think uh, they're well ahead. And we saw that with Carolina, and the, the fans saw it here. It, it was a really top notch game. And um, the thing with Carolina is those guys have been together for a while. Yeah. Um, not not necessarily Ford Baker. Not, but um, the Butitas and the Czech players, Salak, uh, Panacek, uh, Pastuka, they, they've been there for mm-hmm. uh, maybe five years. Like it, It's been quite a bit. So they have a, a chemistry that's just uh, untouched, and it takes advantage of uh, all, all the teams in the league. Like they, they basically have eyes in the back of their head and know where each other are going to be. Um, so, yeah, they're they're well coached too. I know Garrett Rutledge. He was a he was a great coach. They they had a lot of breakouts through the middle, and mm-hmm. uh, they utilize that ice well. But uh, Harry holds those guys accountable, and uh, he's he's been doing a great job with them. So um, yeah, we we could expect to to see them, but um, you know, like never want to look uh, too far ahead. Too far ahead because I think our division, any team can win any night, and. Uh, if you take any team lightly, like you're you're going to get a wake up call very fast. And uh, I believe Watertown's really good, especially when they have Lisa in uh, on the ice and he's not in the box or getting suspended. Like they're <laughs> they're a very dangerous team. And um, I think Elmira is just like you know like one piece away or one last injury, and then Danbury is just they're they're always going to battle and. Uh, they're always going to be in the mix. They're just, they're just that team. They they've created a, a winning culture over there, and I know their record doesn't show it, but um, they're going to battle every single night and give us their our uh, give us their best. This weekend, uh, one game against the Motor City Rockers without Trevor Babin in goal for the uh, Motor City Rockers. Does that change your the way you prepare or get ready for this game, knowing that Babin's not going to be in? No, no. Uh, like some of the guys talked about, they're like, "Oh, Babin's suspended and stuff." But um, they're another team that's well coached, and uh, Gordy over there. I like when we were going into Michigan last year to face them. I was like, yeah. "I think this is the best team." They're. They're, I was kind of a little like, I I wanted that team a little bit because they work their tails off, mm-hmm. and you can tell they they might not be the most skilled, but they're up in your face. They're hard on the four check. They're uh, they're difficult to play against in front of the net, and they're they're a feisty bunch. And yeah, it does kind of stem from their goaltender Babin. He's got that attitude and flair to himself and uh he's not afraid to uh talk some trash and stop the puck immediately after so i mean yeah i i like that we're not 
facing them, but I do think they have some good backups that um, have been getting the job done that looks like they have some good save percentage and low, low uh, goals against. So, um, yeah, there's there's a lot of good goalies in this league because there's not, uh, there's not uh, multiple positions there. Yeah, that's, that's very true. Um, let me ask you this before I let you go. Uh, coming into this uh, weekend, how do you handle a Friday practice without there being a game Friday night? Is there any change the way you would handle Friday? Would it be basically like a Thursday practice, or did you guys move everything up because of New Year's Day? 100%. So it's just uh, everything's moved up. So our normal uh, Thursday practice of uh, special teams and uh, maybe a little tune-up with uh, your line. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that just carries into uh, Friday. So everything got pushed back, especially after uh, a three-game weekend. Um, I made Tuesday optional, but okay. we still had 10, 10 guys in here working out, maybe four or five guys on the ice. Um, they didn't have to show up, but that's just the type of group we have. They they like coming to the rink, and they treat it like a job, and uh, they're, they've been true uh, professionals this entire year. Who, outside of Wally, Anderson, Kirkby, to me, what I've noticed on the ice since he's joined the team, Donald Oliveri is almost like either like a, another captain or another coach. It's pretty amazing how he just naturally can lead people. 100%. And it's just his experience. Um, everyone sees his, his skill and uh, his shot and um, – kind of yeah what he brings to the room hockey iq wise but Mm -hmm. um he he's a great leader and i love i love to have him i love to bounce ideas off him and i he's just he's a really good friend of mine but we keep it business and he's another guy hey coach i'll play i'll play goalie if i have to (laughs) and uh just hang on a sec oh sorry tucker's uh tucker's going wild but um Razor, you know, Tom, Thomas Ray. He's yeah. just leaving the rink, and it's uh, 450. What? Yeah, Are you kidding me? Wait, wait, wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You, can't, you, you, <laughs> so, cannot, you cannot say this, and, and, and why is Thomas Ray still at the rink at 450? What was he doing this whole afternoon? <laughs> because he's a rink rat. He's probably going to cryotherapy, probably doing sprints on the treadmill. Really? Shooting in the shooting room, maybe working on his... Uh, Recovery with uh, the the norm attacks, but yeah, he's, wow. I just, that's why Tucker was uh, he's just going a little nuts there. He, he heard Razor uh, sneaking out of the out of the locker room. We got to put we got to do the Rod Brindamore and just put chains up and <laughs> lock them out someday. It's just a uh, you know. <laughs> well, talk nuts, what's, what's a, well, let's talk about Tommy Ray. He's from Florida, and uh, you know he's he's probably the smallest guy in the team, but seems to have a lot of that fire to be here and i know sometimes you've had to talk to him and maybe coach him a little bit here and there and everything but tommy ray i mean he just i mean he's got like seven goals already on the season yeah he just shows up like he like you'll not like a few of the things he does on the ice and you'll be like oh why isn't he in the shooting lane there or why is he not using his backhand or just kind of those little tendencies that you'd normally off some of our skilled players he's he's starting to develop them a lot but what he can always hang his hat on is his work ethic Mm -hmm. he's uh i think he's the most in shape in the league like really he i i just see it every single day he's running sprints he's uh working out he's he doesn't drink uh do any type of ice and he's Tiled in twenty four seven. I wish he would loosen up a little bit and uh, have a little more fun, which we've gotten him to do. We've gotten him to <laughs> smile a whole lot more, and well, uh, good. instead of just being a focused soldier the entire time. But yeah. um, no, he's uh, he's been like uh, a breath of fresh air. It's like it's awesome seeing a guy that hasn't played hockey in a few years and just coming out of nowhere and uh, really taking advantage of every single day. So. Super happy to have him, and super happy to have Ollie. He yeah. he he is a leader, and yeah. um, he's he's one of my best friends. And uh, we keep it professional at the rink, but um, he would do anything for me, and vice versa. So, 
Um, very lucky for the guys uh, to be around him and bounce ideas off him from his uh, experiences. All right, so let me ask you this question. Are you worried about your team when you go to the shootout? Yeah, I am. We've, yeah. Been, <laughs> we've been having some issues in the shootout. Yeah. And, uh, now we've implemented uh, – Two, two uh, drills uh, a week for shootouts. Good, who's, good. Uh, Going to get picked, and that's that's been going on for like uh, a few weeks. We good. do kind of this uh, breakaway skate. We skate hard down the other end, curl up, and uh, if you score, you're out. And if you don't score, you got to keep doing those sprints. <laughs> so uh, there's a little punishment involved with that, and then. We uh, we do a bucket boy that I've lost the past two weeks, so yeah. I need to get back to the drawing board with my uh, my shootout moves. But um, I, you know what? It, yeah, I I wish I wish we were better at it, but it's like it's not a skill that's going to win you a championship. Right? It's uh, you know you lose those games and it's it sucks like the heartbreaker on on New Year's. You want to. You want the fans leaving the building excited. You want your players yeah. leaving the b- building excited. Like, what a game. And you, you end up going up on the winning end. But in reality, like, uh, I'd rather win in the three-on-three yeah. <laughs> or a five-on-five overtime. So um, I think that's a, a true uh, assessment of the better team. Yeah. But, um, hey, it is what it is. Uh, if, if that's one of our big problems... Um, I think I think we're going to be all right. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. All right, one last fun question. We've seen Tyler George dress a couple times and skate. Could we see Brant Sherwood put some skates on, which I know you do every day in practice mostly, and go out and, and, and could you stop Tyler Jurich from scoring a goal? Could you defend him? On the ice right now, today, if you guys had a game and you were on the ice, Black Bears against the River Sharks, could you stop Tyler George? I I love G, and yeah, I think I could stand next to him and stop him, but I might be uh, giving up something on the other end, so <laughs> I think I'd have to shadow him. But um, if if that guy has some space and he can get a shot off. He, he's going to score. Like, he's got. Uh, we saw this past weekend. He's uh, he's he's very gifted, like uh, Oliveri, yes. as far as his shot goes. And um, I like the we we still tell we still tell Jurich stories. We still tell uh, Yarwood stories <laughs> in the locker room and stuff. So um, we love those guys, and we're happy that they're part of this organization. And it's fun playing against them. Great. I think at the beginning we we're kind of like feeling each other out, you know, you still have that competitive nature yeah. to want to beat. And I, I mean, I'm not as a coach, I, I don't want to kill or hurt the other team, <laughs> but like you still like, you don't want to see them win against you and it really bothers you. But um, no, I, I really respect him as a coach and as a player. He, uh, yeah, he's, he's awesome. And I don't think there's a, maybe Ollie, but uh there's not. There's really not a better guy um, that shoots off that flank than uh, <sighs> Tyler Durich. Yeah, I know both of those guys, uh, Donald Oliveri and of course uh, Tyler Durich. Just that shot is just you know, and and of course you know the River Sharks and himself probably can't resist getting him back out on the ice. It's it's good to it's it's a way to put you know asses in the seats and maybe score some goals. And I mean he's the only guy in the uh, FPHL that's scored over 300 goals in his career, so that's pretty awesome as well. Coach, good luck this weekend against the Motor City Rockers. Uh, this is a big. Is you know, I don't want to say it's a big game, but obviously it's a statement game because you you want Motor City to know there's a reason why you guys are number one in the division and beating Motor City would be a really statement game to make and everything. So good luck this weekend. Yeah, that's what we're looking to do. We're looking to bounce back. Uh, I don't expect this team to lose three times in a row. I don't care if it's overtime or shootout. So yeah, we'll be uh, putting our best foot forward this weekend. And uh, thanks for having me, Bobby, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Awesome. And he is uh, Coach Brent Sherwood from the Binghamton Black Bears. And we'll be right back right after this, right here on the Power Play Post Show.
If you're a Binghamton hockey fan, then you need to check out BinghamtonHockey.net for all your news, stats, information, the Binghamton Hockey Hall of Fame, top 10 lists, profiles, and so much more. That's BinghamtonHockey.net. You're listening to the Power Play Post Show. And welcome back, everybody, to the Power Play Post Show. Uh, great interview with uh, Coach Brant Sherwood. So glad that he came on the show. Remember, uh, 12 noon on Thursday, there's going to be a poll up on the Power Play Post Show Facebook group. You guys get to pick next week's guest. Hopefully that'll work out and not uh, bomb in my face or anything. Um, hopefully you guys don't pick a guy and then he gets traded or something crazy like that. Because uh, that's just that would be just my dumb luck and everything. But now I think it'll be okay. I'm going to have three names that you guys are going to be able to vote on and tell me who you want to hear from. And more than likely you're going to hear from those other two guys uh, at some point in the season as well. Because I do plan on hitting most of the players on the team. Just a couple exceptions, probably because of reasons that makes most sense. All right. The Power Play Post Show is on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and iHeartRadio. That's right. You can actually go to a, a, your Alexa and say, play the Power Play Post Show, and she will do that for you. Just search Power Play Post Show on whichever platform you listen to your podcast and subscribe. Please join the Power Play Post Show Facebook group so you can vote in our poll tomorrow um, or today. Just go to Facebook and search for Power Play Post Show and share that with all your friends and family. Check out BinghamtonHockey.net for all your Binghamton Hockey information and curiosity. And... Uh, Thank you very much for listening. I want to thank um, Rob Lapolis, our MC. I want to thank John Petitucci for our music every single week. And thank you to Brant Sherwood, the head coach of the Binghamton Black Bears. And thank you very much for listening. And you've been listening to the Power Play Post Show. for listening to this edition of the Power Play Post Show. Be sure to tune in next week to the Box Studios Radio Network for all the latest Black Bears news and interviews from around minor league hockey. The Power Play Post Show would like to thank John Patitucci for all the music you hear on the show. You've been listening to the Power Play Post Show.